As you know, I am running for president on an independent uh, slate in all 50 states. The important thing here is to have presidential politics pay attention to the necessities of the American people because presidential politics has been broken for a long time. The two parties have been broken. They need a wake-up call. They need somebody to hold their feet to the fire inside the electoral arena. That's the only language they understand. Outside of Jerry Falwell, I can't think of anybody I have greater contempt, contempt for than Ralph Nader. And I, no one in the history of the world is on a bigger ego trip than Ralph Nader. One is always right. One is, one is, one is prefabricated in purity. I think this is Ralph Nader's understanding of the world. He can't make mistakes because he's saintly. He's the man on the white horse. Thank you, Ralph, for the Iraq War. Thank you, Ralph, for the tax cuts. Thank you, Ralph, for the destruction of the environment. Thank you, Ralph, for the destruction of the Constitution. I find this worse than naive. I think it borders on the wicked. I just think the man needs to go away. I think he needs to live in a different country. He's done enough damage to this one. Let him damage somebody else's now. There are some of his major supporters that just... Ralph, go back to examining the rear end of automobiles and don't risk costing the Democrats a White House this year as you did four years ago. Well, that's the real, that's the real tragedy. It's, it, it's going to be the first line of his, bi of his obit. It's really, there's a Shakespearean feature to this. It's the responsibility of a serious person. On the issues not that Nader stood for, it wasn't just A lot of people still be alive. If Ralph had been silenced from March to November. Go back to examining the rear end of automobiles. Two perish in the cab of burning truck. Two Wisconsin couples die in car collision in North Dakota. Fifteen children orphaned. Texas collision takes five lives. Crash kills six on Chicago Highway and on and on through the daily newspapers. Ralph decided that uh, auto safety was of interest to him when uh, some friends of his had been victimized by unsafe cars. Frederick Condon was a Harvard Law School classmate of mine, and at age 28, with a wife and four children, he was driving home from work in New Hampshire one evening, and the car rolled. There were no seat belts in those days. He was uh, half in, half out on the roll and became a paraplegic. And on his own as a freelance journalist, Ralph wrote an article for The Nation magazine in 1959 about the designed-in dangers of automobiles, totally novel topic uh, at the time. I was working at the New Republic magazine. And that was a time, I have to say, when the New Republic magazine was sort of liberal. I called up, and it just so happened that Jim Ridgway answered. And he always had, like, one of these stories about what was going on under the surface. Now, they weren't conspiracy stories, but they were also, but they bordered on <laughs> He said, I'm very busy. You've got three minutes. And I said, well, I, you know, I can get it across in three minutes. And, you know, the, his big thing was the car, the Corvair car. The uh, 1960 to 63 Corvair which has some remarkable characteristics. It's one of the few cars I know that can do the bossa nova on dry pavement and the Watutsi on wet. yip yo Corvair! Nothing to it with Corvair's rear engine balance and traction. Ralph pointed out that with its uh, swing axle rear suspension, and it's a rear engine vehicle, that a lot of times uh, a person in a maneuver uh, on the highway, the vehicle would tend to slide out or oversteer. Uh, going around a curb, for example, it would tend to slide out and it would then trip and roll over. There were people that were being needlessly killed and paralyzed and burned in vehicle crashes. I read an article in the New Republic by James Ridgway, Corvair Tragedy. I felt so upset that this, the possibility that automobile manufacturers were aware of design flaws that endangered passengers and still manufactured them. This was not a popular subject, you know. This was before anybody was really interested in this stuff. I said, Jim, if half of what you wrote is true, 
It's a national outrage, and we must have a book. And Jim said, everything I wrote was true, but I'm not going to write any book for you or anybody else. And he said, besides which, anybody who writes about this subject leans on a guy in Washington, a lawyer named Ralph Nader. He knows more than any other 10 people in the world about the whole area of automobile safety. He said, you'll have a tough time finding him. I finally got hold of the secret number of the boarding house on 19th Street, which I can still remember. Adams 41978, I'll never forget it. He took that isolated accident, which was always blamed on the so-called nut behind the wheel, and said that, no, this is something that's preventable. Uh, we can design cars more safely. That hadn't occurred to anybody before. The nut behind the wheel is a myth. You know, what kills you in an auto crash is how the structure of the vehicle behaves. And yet they said the whole thing is how you drive. Not that the steering wheel spears you, not that the, you know, the roof crashes in on your head. No, 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 it's how you drive that's relevant. It's a myth. People knew that automobile accidents had been occurring for decades. What they didn't know was that this was a systematic issue. Uh, the engineers knew all along that they were, you know, they were building junk. I'd fly to Detroit Airport and we'd circle uh, the airport in an um, unlabeled motor vehicle while I was uh, interviewing these uh, whistleblowers who I called uh, hidden patriots. And of course, they didn't want their names known because they'd be fired by the auto company that employed them. Here was someone saying, this vehicle that you think is the, is the essence of your happiness, that, that the advertising community in Detroit has told you is everything you're ever going to need to be happy, is incredibly, recklessly dangerous. The issue about marketing that book always was, do people, even if it's every word in it is true, and everything about it is as outrageous as he says, do people want to read about that? There was one particularly interested party, and this made all the difference. Somebody once said to me, is Ralph paranoid? And I said, he's only paranoid because people are following him. The same thing goes on here all the time. The only reason anybody investigates anybody, you know, outside of these congressional hearings, which now don't account, amount to anything, is to smear people, following them around, usually trying to get them in sexual activity, is to get them down. He started to get calls at odd hours, two or three in the morning, and they would have strange covers. They'd say, um, you know, this is Western Union calling, there's a package for you, that kind of thing. They'd also say threatening things like, you know, watch out, buddy boy. Mother was getting calls in three o'clock in the morning calls saying, tell your son, you know, to shove off. And there were threats. I was walking to the old Sandoff's building in an underground corridor that they use. One of the Capitol policemen said to me, uh, you better get out here, there are a couple of detectives following you. And I said, what do you mean? The two guys following me. He said, uh, uh, didn't you write a book on auto safety? I said, no. It was February of 66, a Saturday afternoon, when Ralph Nader told me he'd been followed the previous day. Well, you can't write a story uh, saying somebody says he's being followed. There's absolutely no evidence of it. I felt that I, I better tell somebody in case I wound face down in the Potomac or Anacostia River or something. Something, you know, something strange was going on. So I uh, told my uh, editor, the national editor of the uh, Washington Post, Larry Stern. And then Larry Stern, he, my boss, told me that another Post reporter who has white skin and black hair had told him something very similar. Because we were so tall, thin, uh, dark, dark hair. I was you know, astonished to have this, this confirmation. The detective was following people along, making telephone calls and saying he was somebody or other. He went to Ralph Nader's friends and associates and pretended that he was, that Ralph Nader had been offered a job. People began to wonder why, if he was being offered a job, were they so consumed with, you know, was he smoking pot, was he gay? They put it together and realized, yes, in fact, a person who's testifying before Congress has someone breathing down their neck, trying to figure out what's going on. They call some of the big auto companies. Ford says, it's not us. Chrysler says, it's not us. General Motors um, sort of um, you know, issues a statement where they indicate they don't know what's going on, but they don't, they don't um, demur. 
I can remember getting a call in the wee hours of the morning from Ralph. And I said, well, what's the matter? And he said, it's GM. General Motors sends sexy women into a supermarket to seduce him into a compromising position. I mean, I thought this was the damnedest thing I'd ever heard in my life. After we heard that uh, General Motors had turned the babes loose on him in, uh, in the grocery, and we thought that was an unwise decision from a public relations standpoint for our greatest corporation. I mean, General Motors was clearly, you know, pissed off. Because, you know, they were going to face a lot of suits. I mean, there was a lot of serious stuff here. When this was confirmed that General Motors was responsible, the uh, Senator Ribicoff from Connecticut, who headed the relevant Senate committee in this area, went ballistic. The president of General Motors was summoned. You've got television cameras out there, and you've got a packed congressional hearing room. Everything's set up for maximum theater. You've got Bobby Kennedy there, Abraham Ribicoff, and then at a lower elevation, James Roach, the CEO of General Motors. Legal right to ascertain necessary facts preparatory to litigation. I don't see how you can know and order the investigation and then put out a statement like this, which is not accurate. That, um, Mr. Uh, Roach, disturbs me as much uh, as the fact that you conducted the investigation in the way that it was conducted in the beginning. It made a huge impact because it was clear that there was something substantive here. Let us assume that you found something wrong with this sex life. What would that have to do with whether or not he was right or wrong on the car there? Nothing. What Ribikoff had a copy of the book on the table in front of him as he was questioning General Motors, who said, and so you hired detectives to try to get dirt on this young man to besmirch his character because of statements he made about your unsafe automobiles. And then he grabbed the book and threw it down on the table and said, and you didn't find a damn thing. I think the thing that has persuaded me to continue uh, uh, and, and continue in this area is that I don't want to have a climate in this country where one has to have an ex ascetic uh, uh, existence and, and steely determinations in order to speak truthfully and candidly and critically of American industry. I want to apologize here and now to the members of this subcommittee and Mr. Nader. I sincerely hope that these apologies will be accepted. Well, the chairman of a big corporation admits something like that and apologizes, boy, that's big news for everybody. It launched Ralph Nader into, into instant national prominence. And it, it intersects with the auto safety bill. The hearing on Ralph being followed by General Motors was in March of 1966, and the bill's through the Senate in May, which is just amazing. Well, somehow be able to build in more safety without building on more costs. If you get things out in the open, uh, you'll get some action. Uh, there's no place for secrecy uh, anywhere uh, in traffic safety. It's the record of the press. Uh, they don't pay attention to all kinds of serious issues until there's some kind of spark. I've often said I, I thought that if, if uh, that GM detective who had tailed him and, and uh, spotted him in a safe way with his hand on a girl's fanny, that would have been the end. He wouldn't have, I don't, the issue would not have taken off. Winstead, Connecticut was a town then about 10,000 people. There were lots of mills in town. It was a town that had lots of immigrants, Polish, Italian, people from the Middle East, Arabic, um, and Yankee. It was quite a mix. Winstead was governed by a town meeting form of government, uh, which meant that the citizens would convene a town meeting, and they were the legislature, probably the most pristine form of democracy in the world. We would be taken to these town meetings at a young, impressionable age by my mother and father. Dad came to this country in 1912. He was self-made in every way. He was in the food business, but I think what he most liked was not so much the business business part of it, but he loved talking to people, particularly about politics. They used to say, when you went into Nader's restaurant, 
For a nickel, you got a cup of coffee and 10 minutes of political conversation. And people would sometimes say to him, Mr. Nader, if you continue along that line, you're going to alienate people and they're not going to want to come into your business. And that didn't bother him a bit. <laughs> he said, when I went past the Statue of Liberty, I took it seriously. So you have the freedom to speak your mind. Every morning before school started, Ralph's father would announce at the breakfast table a topic that was to be covered at dinner that night. He would give us um, uh, problems to answer. It wasn't just a simple question of fact. He would say, well, we're, we're going to talk now about the problems of Main Street and the lack of parking. And so we try to figure out how to solve this parking <laughs> problem. We had opinions because we had to, because we talked about these things at the dinner, dinner tables. You weren't allowed to run, and you certainly weren't allowed to run if you were losing the argument. One time when I was around 10, I went home from school, went in the backyard, and my father was there, and he said, uh, well, Ralph, what did you learn in school today? Did you learn how to believe, or did you learn how to think? My mother really was focused on her family. And as we grew and went into the school system, she became a great community activist in all kinds of issues. Mother Nader is at one time, who's alleged to have talked to Senator Prescott Bush, the grandfather of the current president. He came to his constituents to see how things were, because we had the big floods, you know, which destroyed in the middle of 55. It just uh, gutted Main Street. So we needed a dry dam. So she went through the reception line, and as she was shaking hands, she said, uh, Senator Bush, uh, I want you to promise me that you will go back to Washington and get us a dry dam so this kind of destructive flood never happens again. And he said, yes, it was very pleasant to see you. He began to move her on. She would not let go until he promised her. And there's a dam in the Mad River. Right outside Winstead, I'll show it to you. Today, Ralph Nader settled for $425,000 his action against General Motors arising out of harassment by General Motors and invasion of his privacy. After the um, congressional testimony and after the apology that Ralph Nader got from, from James Roach, CEO of General Motors, it wasn't done with GM yet. So um, he, he launched a um, what was then a landmark um, invasion of privacy case. This is by far the largest amount ever paid as damages for invasion of privacy or in any other similar type case. There was a delicious irony in the fact that General Motors provided the seed money for the career and history that has become Ralph Nader. In other words, this is not the end of the crusade of Ralph Nader against General Motors and other uh, corporations that he feels are acting in the same manner. The misuse of law as an instrument of oppression is not new. The annual increase of oil and gas prices. Fantastic swindling in the marketplace, knowingly. One million pounds of meat a day is unfit for human consumption. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, corporate crime, and the National Air Pollution Control Administration. You are committing well, a fraud in the American public. Proof. Do you want me to read you the 18 volumes before this committee and the Senate Antitrust Committee? What do you call them? Do you want me to reproduce them all? The facts are overwhelming. I saw Ralph Nader in a suit of armor on the cover of Newsweek magazine. It was in 68, and that's what gave Bob Felmuth the idea of contacting him. I had never written or spoken to anyone I considered as important as Ralph at that point. And I don't mean famous, I mean important. So we said, all right, well, we'll write a letter. Uh, I wrote him a letter, and I said, I want to join you in your judicious jihad, which I thought was very clever at the time. Uh, I didn't really know that he was from the Christian area of Lebanon, and the only people interested in jihad probably wanted to do his family in. Five days later, around midnight, Ralph calls, and uh, we had a long conversation. With, I was trying to convince him, hey, there's this enormous pool of student power. You ought to try to tap into that. He was very, very close to the best. Oh, he asked me one other thing. He wanted to know if I ever, if I played chess or poker. He uh, said, come down to uh, Washington and meet us. And we walk into uh, O'Donnell's Fish Restaurant, 
and he looks around and looks at us, spots us. I guess we must have stood out, these two twerps uh, in suits. And he uh, says, Thelmuth, Eggendorf, yes, yes, nods curtly, sits down, looks at us. No greeting like, how was your trip? None of that. Just there's an agency that's been pulling the wool over the eyes of the people of this town for a long time. You know, of course, which one I'm talking about. And, of course, I'm the smart alecky guy. So I said, of course, you're talking about the Interstate Commerce Commission. No. The Securities and Exchange Commission. No. The Federal Power Commission. No. The Atomic Energy Commission. No. I'm running out of alphabet soup. Um, so I finally said, you know, okay, I give up. He said the Federal Trade Commission. And I said, well, that's interesting. They have a pretty good reputation. And he said, precisely my point. It's a shame that you should ever feel tired because of iron poor blood. What can you do when iron poor tired blood makes you feel run down? You can take Geritol. This is the point where Ralph wanted me to look into the Geritol situation because the FTC really didn't go after major players, only little players. And I said, well, what's the goal here? What are we really trying to do? And he said, well, at a minimum, to revive the FTC. But as for you, to demonstrate the student power you told me about. Once he decided to use students, Bob and I were chosen to start it. Uh, he had seven people lined up to investigate the FTC. You could call them, I guess, radical nerds. They didn't believe in, in the way the system was being operated, but they believed in the values of the system. Radical nerds is pretty good, although the radicals would, would have said uh, uh, nerds, not radical nerds. Instead of wanting to tear down the system, we said, you know, that ninth grade, that ninth grade civics model, that was a pretty good model. I think I want to see it in place. We were naturally attracted to Nader because he was kind of doing that. It was kind of a different kind of thing for people to do during that era, because this was the 60s. People who were young were convinced that the older people had screwed things up pretty badly. Our movement benefited enormously from the hundreds of thousands of people who were fighting uh, the Vietnam War and fighting for civil rights and who were in the streets. It created the climate, the atmosphere, that made our efforts appear less extreme. Members of the press have referred to you as uh, Nader's Raiders. I was a brand new reporter at the Post, and they sent me to the Federal Trade Commission, where these five or six young college guys were raking the Federal Trade Commission, which was this icon of regulatory power. So Greider wrote an article, and he, he just called us Nader's Raiders, and that was the term that stuck. It was just a catchy phrase that expressed it very neatly. Ralph, for years, would scold me. You to miss the whole idea of individual citizens. You're trying to make it into a celebrity game. When you're making me into an icon. That's not what this is about, and so forth and so on. Mr. Nader has shown students who say that it's impossible to change things through the system, that in fact it is possible to affect change from within. We bought Ralph's idea. We were going to make the country what it ought to be by working and pressing the system to work. I just put a little note up in various schools and said, if you're interested, send me your resume and your interest. And I got maybe four or five hundred responses, just based on a note written, you know, put on a bulletin board somewhere. And it was that summer that all of these 110 people lined up the steps of the Capitol. And the title of the picture is, The Lone Ranger Gets a Posse. Ralph had decided to do about six or eight teams attacking different agencies. There was a team on the Food and Drug Administration, one on water pollution, one on air pollution. These groups all came out and they eventually published books. Um, the FDA report became the Chemical Feast. The air pollution became Vanishing Air. The report on water pollution became Water Wasteland. Those were the Nader's Raiders doing that work with Ralph orchestrating it from a distance. He was the kind of person who said, you're in charge of this, here's the mission, do it. And then he'd review the final product and give you a sign off at the end. But he wasn't he respected you. And the quality of the reports that came out was on the whole pretty high. There was never one of the Nader reports of that summer or any summer since then that was exposed as a fraud. In the late 60s and early 70s, Ralph would be in national polls as one of the most famous admired Americans up there with Walter Cronkite, what have you. And so people threw around his name for president and he would always laugh it off. Stuff they don't would you want, consider yeah. running for president? No. Why? I have, are you, are you, there's a, yeah, there's a good reason. I think that uh, the political system, the country today, is so encrusted with bureaucracy and special interests and waste and inefficiency that 
what you have to do is step back and start by trying to help organize people and trying to get them to see citizenship as a profession. And then, out of this kind of grassroots effort, will come better candidates. In 1972, of course, uh, Eagleton was on and then off the ticket. The phone rings at Nader headquarters, and this 21-year-old you know, guy, fresh out of college, picks up the phone. It's uh, George McGovern, and he's in shock. Can't believe it. A candidate for president of the United States is there on the line. And he called up a number of people, including myself, to ask if uh, we were willing to be considered for a vice presidential candidacy on his ticket. Because at that point, they needed something, we call it a Hail Mary pass, something just to shake up what was a bad situation. And I said, I appreciate very much, thank you very much for calling me about this, but I'd prefer to remain as a full-time citizen. A huge political change in Ralph's fortunes came when Jimmy Carter was elected. Well, I'm glad that Mr. Nader's come down. We had a, a brief conversation before the convention and uh, decided then that after the convention was over that he would come down and spend the night to discuss some of the problems that uh, consist among consumers and that might be of, ish, uh, of importance to the American people. Mr. Nader, what are the principal things you would like to see a Carter administration do that would aid consumers? I think uh, basically to enforce the laws uh, affecting consumers, uh, which have been around. Ralph Nader basically thought that, you know, that Camelot days had arrived. The next uh, four years, I think, will provide uh, a spectacular potential for a confrontation between the Congress and the executive branch as to how the power is going to be distributed within our government and <clears throat> to whom it is going to be accountable. You know, here he had someone who was sympathetic to his point of view, a Democrat in office, and Nader thought he was going to be willing to enact the types of things that Nader wanted to see enacted. The point is that the Carter administration afforded opportunities that hadn't been present, at least during this consumer movement of the late 20th century, for people to go into government and try and make a difference. Many Nader allies became appointees in the new Carter administration. Perhaps the most prominent among them was Joan Claybrook. Carter had been very favorable to hire women in high positions. I was asked to head the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And so I went to Ralph and said that uh, I'd been asked to take this job. Ralph does not like people to leave his organization. He gets very angry at them when they leave. I said that I thought that this was important for the, the cause. And he had to admit that it was. I told all the people who worked with us and who went into the Carter administration that they were carrying the reputation of consumer protection into their jobs and that if they didn't uphold that reputation, I was going to criticize them publicly. This created some new tensions between Ralph, the outside campaigner, and his allies now on the inside who had a more complex set of political issues to negotiate. The first decision to be made on auto safety was on airbags. It hadn't happened in the Ford administration, so it was now on the table for the Carter administration. And there was a law that was passed in 1974 that said that the Congress could veto this decision. For me, the issue was to get this not vetoed by the Congress. So I felt that if we gave them a little bit more lead time, that would make it possible for us to, to be successful. And then Ralph got mad. First of all, it was a three or four year delay before the first category of cars uh, could get the airbag. And uh, I knew that the auto industry, given that period of time, would strike back and try to scuttle or get the regulation uh, revoked. And so he first he wrote one letter, and no one paying attention to it. So then he wrote a meaner letter, and it got on the front page of the Washington Post. It was a tough letter. But on the other hand, this was the biggest auto safety standard in modern history, and I saw it going down the drain. It was not just some little spat. It uh, broke the back of the regulatory auto safety movement for more than a few years. This was the ultimate clash between high-minded idealism and personal loyalty. I had a press conference in my own inner office with only about four or five reporters, and he knocked over a secretary or two, and not literally, but you know what I mean, verbally, and um, walked in and sat in, and we had the fight right there. 
I came up to her, and in front of the press, crowding around her, I said, surely you don't believe in this decision, do you? And she says, absolutely, I believe in it. That's, to me, you know, that, that set the stage for the criticism. It's OK. I mean, I'm tough. I can have a fight with him. It was just I'd rather, rather have a discussion with him rather than a public dispute, but that's the way he, he framed it, so that's the way it was. Well, to me, my, my compass was the people on the highway. I, I was working, in effect, as a trustee for people on the highway. And so things like uh, associates, friendships, sentiment uh, are secondary to pushing life-saving standards into law. Some people said that he shouldn't have, you know, uh, been so harsh on someone he knew was had the best intentions. but. You know, that's Ralph's way. Personal loyalty cannot come at any price. It becomes an indulgence. Uh, and uh, you ask yourself, personal loyalty for what? Well, for marching shoulder to shoulder to an accomplished objective. But if that no longer is the case, then what's the function of personal loyalty? It's unadulterated, mawkish sentiment while people are dying needlessly on the highway. We didn't talk for about a year, maybe two, but we got over it. Uh, a recurrent theme in Ralph's advocacy has been concern for the integrity of the body. Many of Ralph's policy initiatives have tried to develop new legal doctrines, new regulatory schemes to protect the body from assault and harm. One nuclear power plant catastrophe it would be 45,000 dead, well over 100,000 seriously injured, untold damage to future generations. For about a decade, Ralph had the field almost to himself. He had built a legislative record as a private citizen that would have been the envy of any modern president. That included the Clean Air Act, Mining Health and Safety Act, the Freedom of Information Act, Occupational Safety and Health Act. Ralph also provided uh, the leadership and seed money to start numerous consumer organizations. Congress Watch, the Health Research Group, the Critical Mass Energy Project, the Tax Reform Research Group, the Litigation Group, all of these were eventually joined together as public citizen. The workers today are being manipulated by companies and by government in a far Corporate America was flummoxed. They the were just getting skewered right and left and didn't know how to respond. But by the mid to late 70s, they started to mobilize their own response. Uh, and the showdown came in 1978 when Ralph wanted to uh, enact a consumer protection agency law, which became the drop-dead epic battle in Congress. It meant whether people were going to live or die or get sick or get injured or be ripped off in their family budget by, you know, banks and insurance companies and home mortgage companies and, and all the rest of the unsafe products that were at large in the marketplace. The idea was one office of advocates who would argue on behalf of consumers in all the other federal agencies. It was going to be kind of like an ombudsman. It wasn't going to be a regulatory body. It was going to represent citizens aggrieved by various consumer abuses. And this was an idea that had been on the table since the early 70s, had passed one house one time, another house another time, but for six years hadn't ever become law. Now Carter's president, and Ada had a good relationship with him. It's time to pass the Consumer Protection Agency. I do know that he's taken the positions as president thus far that he has promised to take as candidate. Uh, he has come out for the Consumer uh, Advocacy Bill. The Consumer Protection Agency Bill was a big one we were fighting before. I think I went in with Reagan. It was a bureaucracy. It was going to have enormous powers. And we fought that very, very hard because we were very anti-big government. And that's what we saw it as. It really was the first time they'd been as organized locally. They do that in all kinds of issues now. It was kind of their test run. This became their number one ask, vote against the consumer bill. We tried to be creative. Let's do something different. And said, uh, how much would it cost to, to set up this consumer protection agency? It would cost, the guess what was $5 million, $15 million. That worked out to, at the time, a nickel person. We got 40,000 people to send nickels to the members of Congress to say, I support the Consumer Protection Agency. Here's my five cents. So there was the joke that it was a bribe, and 
With all due respect to members of Congress, you can't, they can't be bought for a nickel. Those nickels attached to postcards was the biggest grassroots effort the consumer movement ever had. Passed the Senate, failed in the House, and then was never enacted. Uh, I think it was 227 to 189, a vote I won't ever forget. It didn't help that uh, Jimmy Carter didn't go to bat for the issue either. At the critical moment when we needed his uh, lobbying help in the House of Representatives, he did not uh, expend the political capital. It failed because it was caught up in what we now know as the beginnings of the Reagan revolution. The Reagan-like rhetoric against it scared swing congressmen who made the difference. The argument that this was more big government uh, was rhetorical, shallow, and persuasive. It wasn't easy to get over it initially. And I think it left Ralph fairly disillusioned. Uh, many people say that that was the high watermark of his influence. And from then on, it, uh, his influence receded because he was not able to push through, in 1978, the Consumer Protection Agency Act. DuPont Circle was the center of all the public interest groups. That's where the health research group and public citizen and, like, Greenpeace and, you know, Citizens for the Environment, every, every public interest group, because it was cheap to live around there for people like me at the time. Nader's offices were always the building that was about to be demolished to put up a spanking clean luxury building. This is not it was cheap office space because you weren't that close to the hill. A lot of this is actually Ralph stuff and books. We have books everywhere. We had pillars in the office, the pillars made of boxes of books and remaindered books and books that Ralph thought were important and may, you know, be pulped uh, at some point. He didn't want them to uh, disappear. His office is in there, but it's sort of sprawled out into here because he just has so much stuff. And it's just this total mess. It's just like some sort of like very, 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 very fucked up library. <laughs> he swears it's organized chaos and he knows where everything is, but, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to tell if he's in there or not because there's, the papers are stacked so high. Anyone, any of the staff are allowed to go in there, but we usually don't have camera crews only because of the state that it's in. Stacks of mail. Ralph got more mail than anybody I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I think Ralph got more mail than the Beatles. People would write to him thinking that he could solve their problems. People would call in and, and ask him to do everything for them. You know, fix my hospital bill, help me with this people who are desperate. One day, this package comes in. It's like the size of a tree. <laughs> We're all sitting there. It's like, what is this? And it's a drive shaft from a car. And this woman had sent it in saying, I went to the dealership. I went to all these places that said they could help me fix it, and no one would help me fix it. You have to help me. Please, Ralph Nader, help me. One day, the FedEx man came, and he had a box uh, with a lot of dry ice in it. And I thought, what is this? And I opened it up. A guy had sent his lung to Ralph because he was upset that they had taken out his lung and he didn't know if it was really cancerous. Which basically showed how much um, trust Ralph had uh, in, the, in the public's mind. There was an image of a Nader's Raider coming out of the late 60s, early 70s, and they're just these you know, smart, sharp people, totally into whatever the issue they're working on and just grinding the midnight oil, writing the book, writing the brief, writing the report, all work and no fun. But it's also a very collegial set of people who shared the same values, shared the same commitments, uh, were working on many of the same goals and some, even some of the same specific projects. It, it pays in, in psychological rewards. So he created an environment where you could do exactly what you felt was right. Think about that. How many Americans today can say that they work in a job where every day they go to work and do exactly what they think was right? There's a satisfaction that uh, if you don't do it, it won't get done. What Nader told me when I first interviewed with him, you can bring your conscience to work every day.
everybody worked until two in the morning or so, and then we just collapsed and would get up at, at eight and start working again. I mean, we were there, you know, 24 seven. It was just ridiculous. He would always work harder and ask more of himself than he would ask of anybody else. So he led by the force of his example. Do you install those values in your children and how do you go about doing that? Well, I don't have any children. I, I, I'm married to General Motors. <laughs> People always used to say, why didn't you get married? And he would say, well, what wife would want to tolerate this? And uh, my working, you know, 18 hours a day. It's, a, it's really a tough choice. I mean, if, if, if you're going to ra raise children, you, you should be there. He gave me a line I'll never forget. It's like, Keen, there are two kinds of people in this world, the hardcore and the spouse core. You got to decide what side are you on. So he knew enough that if you're going to be that kind of a workaholic, as we call it, then maybe there are other things you can't participate in. Today, I think he probably regrets he said that. I know he regrets I keep repeating it, but those are his exact words back then. He was like a, a priest or a monk because he didn't really have a life like most of us do. It's the hardcore and the spouse core. Which side are you on? <laughs> no one knows anything about Ralph's personal life, okay? I dug and dug and dug, hoping to find something. I mean, the very fact that, that you know, the man is so, has been associated romantically really with just about nobody. You know, Ralph's personal life is his job. And as it got further into it, I began to think of it as the anti-sex scandal. I hope Ralph does have a girlfriend hidden away somewhere. But I don't think he does, OK? People always think of Ralph as this doer, gloomy person who is always coming in with these horror stories. This comes, I'm sure, as a surprise to many people who know his public persona, he's very, very funny. He actually has a great sense of humor. And you don't see that in his public persona, and that's unfortunate, because that's part of his charm, and that's part of the reason some of us uh, who worked for him still have such great affection for him after all these years. Ralph was preparing to testify about the, the hidden menace of America's hot dog supply, how these had some kind of additive in them that was uh, destroying the nation's well-being. And so we spent about a half an hour thinking about the slogan that would make it into the evening news. Was it the world's, uh, America's most dangerous unguided missile, America's most dangerous guided missile? Uh, I do not feel the same concern that Mr. Nader expressed about hot dogs. Uh, I certainly would not call them missiles of death as he did. Uh, <laughs> well, I, had, I had forgotten it was missile of death. <laughs> so uh, those were the days. <laughs> Whenever Ralph would come back from the hill, everybody would flock into the room because you knew that Ralph was going to recreate the hearing and what somebody said. He used to love to do Nixon. He would get the, the scowl and the, and, the, and the glower and the jowls and so forth, and he would, he would do things like, I am not a crook. <laughs> One of the most interesting weeks I've spent was being a sidekick to Ralph as he moved around Saturday Night Live. The Saturday Night Live footage is fascinating to watch because you will rarely see a person as ill at ease as this. Ralph Nader is, one, being on television, two, um, being at a comedy show. He's a terrible actor because he's authentic. Uh, and he did great because it was Ralph Nader wearing an airbag that was supposed to explode. But it didn't. Whoops. Well, live from New York, it's Saturday night. I was kind of disturbed by the first. It was like not, uh, not dignified enough. Bert, I'd like to introduce you to, uh, to Pam. And I'd like to introduce you to Rita. Rita has been naughty this afternoon, so she has to sit back for <laughs> would, you, uh, would you like to... I loved one week later, in 1977, the story that someone saw him on the street and said to him, I know you. You're the comedian. Uh, whatever doubts I might have had about it were, were erased in the next month because people said to me, you know, my kid brother didn't know anything about Nader until he saw him on Saturday Night Live. Governor Reagan, we just want 
wanted to show you what the map of the United States looks like as of 8 o'clock tonight. Hey! Oh, yeah. <laughs> when, that, when that began to slide, I thought that maybe the world was going out just as I was getting in. The Reagan years were a particularly grim time for uh, Nader and his groups. The Reagan administration has announced a review of 30 additional government regulations to see if they are... The administration's hit list of regulations include many protecting equal rights, prompting Ralph Nader to say... In the last few months, it's been quite clear that the Reagan administration wants to, every way it can, remove the application of law and order to the operations of business these people knew how to play politics. They knew how to play hardball. To be in Washington in the early years of the Reagan presidency with Ralph Nader and watching him react to the effort to kind of systematically undo what he had spent 20 years building. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means, and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities, and on these principles, there will be no compromise. It's almost like a bad dream where Reagan would appoint to run these agencies, not just people who were from the industries that were being regulated, but people who had devoted their entire careers to tearing down and trying to destroy the very agencies they were now being charged to uh, run. The Nader people bravely tried to document what was going on, but the electoral power and the persuasive ability of Reagan was just too great. There was a really fascinating memorandum written by um, Justice Powell when he was the general counsel of the Chamber of Commerce. And he said, there's a threat to America. These public interest groups are a huge threat to America, and every corporation has to react. At the time he wrote, what's now known as the Powell Memo. He was an attorney. Of course, he did go on to become a Supreme Court Justice. This was not an obscure figure. This was a call to action by a leading corporate lawyer trying to rally the troops, saying, we're in trouble here. We got to do something very different. And we have to take back the minds and the hearts of the students and the academics and the media. And uh, we've got to fight them tooth and nail. That did spur the business community to reevaluate their, their role in politics and what they were doing. Corporate America was investing considerable resources in uh, propaganda efforts, in think tanks that would develop uh, bogus disciplines like cost benefit and risk management analysis to try to change the whole terms of debate. And it has completely transformed the way politics take place in DC and across the country. The Heritage Foundation is a free market think tank. We do uh, research and educational efforts on the benefits of limited government, individual responsibility, strong national defense. Uh, we like to portray ourselves as having been Ronald Reagan's favorite think tank. Ralph approached health and safety regulation as an ethical and social issue. Corporate America redefined it as an economic issue. Corporations don't have that much power in Washington. They tend to be ineffective, especially on the big picture issues. They might be able to get a little special loophole in some bill or a special handout in another bill, but especially in a globalized economy where you have foreign companies penetrating the U.S. market, U.S. companies are probably, probably about the most helpless entities out there. These corporate think tanks go through their daily life thinking that their, uh, their glass is only 97% full. The, the 80s was a period in which the alliance between the Democrats and the public interest movement uh, started to fray. Too often, Democrats would not go to the bat in the same courageous ways uh, to protect the victories of the 60s and 70s. Ralph had relied upon a New Deal and Great Society coalition. That coalition started to fall apart. The whole thing that we were trying to do was the Great New Deal coalition is to drive these wedges into that coalition, split it off, and take parts of it for the Republican base. And you did this on, with social, cultural issues. You carve off all their issues, which, are, which are, do not conflict with your own and which comport with your own social cultural beliefs and keep hammering and hammering and hammering them. And the strategy was called in those days the Northern Catholic 
Southern Protestant strategy. And so without the protective cover of that electoral uh, base, uh, Nader's political initiatives were far more vulnerable. The Reagan era basically forced him to, to recreate himself. He realized people in Washington weren't going to listen, so he would go straight to the people. Consumer activist Ralph Nader has been campaigning... Recreate himself as a grassroots activist. It was the beginning of the change from the inside the Beltway, Ralph, to Ralph the out there in the whole country, uh, touching people's lives every day. For a long time, they had just been writing theories out of Washington and, and things that people should do, but they weren't out there where the real action was. He, he said that I was his Paul Revere, that he would just throw me into the community not knowing anybody, and I, I would have to f find out how to work on an issue, and then I'd call for reinforcements back in Washington. His first idea, which was wacky, was to have me parachute into towns and say, the Nader Raiders are here to help. Well, I had this fantasy that wasn't totally whimsical, that we would have a, a crew of five civic paratroopers, and they would parachute into the town. The problem was you could never get them insured, and how could we be assured of the quality of the parachutes if uh, the vendor knew what they were being used for? But it, it got crazy because he would literally just leave, leave me in any community. Once I got everybody going forward on an issue, this, Ralph would come in and give a speech uh, to really empower them more and say, you guys aren't alone here. When the community of Pole Town in Detroit was going to be condemned so that General Motors could build a new Cadillac plant there, Ralph provided direct assistance for them to uh, physically resist the bulldozers. people here. Uh, in Van Nuys, there were a lot of uh, children coming down with leukemia in a neighborhood, and a General Motors uh, plant was there, and uh, they, they put benzene in the paint, which is causing cancer and leukemia. We got them to change the, the way that they manufactured the paint. Californians love their cars, but hate their auto insurance rate. In the mid-80s, we had a huge insurance crisis all over the country. The insurance industry sponsored proposals here in California to limit people's right to go to court. People didn't know who to believe or what to believe, but everybody knew that Ralph Nader would never betray them. The insurance companies are financial, sacred cash cows feeding the public a lot of not-so-sacred bull. So they voted yes on Prop 103. And this is the victory for the little guy, for us. And of course, Proposition 103 delivered $1.2 billion in rate refunds and $23 billion in savings uh, the first 10 years just on auto insurance premiums alone. The second you would say, I'm a Nader's Raider, uh, all of a sudden there was an instant credibility where people, was like, people were like, I so much admire that man, I admire what he's done for this country. Well, in 1984, we were still uh, of the persuasion that the Democrats, uh, the Democrats are not as bad as the Republicans, so you've got to try to get them into office. So we had uh, a very, very competent staff of about a dozen people, and they went around the country in key states to show the difference between Mondale's policies and the Democratic Party's programs and the Republicans and, and Reagan. The, uh, we utilized the, uh, a good old bus that I designed, the, uh, the difference in 84, and this bus had all the issues uh, listed on its side that we were trying to ask people to ask their legislators and their, their c candidates about. And, and try to keep those Democrats that were moving forward towards the nomination accountable to, to the citizens out there and, and the issues that we cared about. But the national press ignored it because, after all, we weren't inside the electoral arena. We were on the outside. I remember the, uh, the diminutive pin we had for the difference in 84. Look at this. This is the difference in 84. You can barely see it, okay? Maybe this could sum it up, but that's the original pin. Obviously, there were many Democrats that simply wanted to be like Ronald Reagan. He had the winning formula. Uh, that was uh, basically the precursor of about 20 years uh, from 1980 to 2000, where we tried every way to get the Democrats to pick up on issues that really commanded the, the felt concern and daily life of millions of Americans, but were issues that corporations didn't want attention paid to it. And so, you know, when people say, why'd you do this in 2000 and so on, I'm saying, I'm a 20-year veteran 
of pursuing the folly of the least worst between the two parties. Because when you do that, you end up allowing them to both get worse every four years. The first time he ran for president was this write-in campaign in the New Hampshire primaries in 1992. I am none of the above, and I'm not running for president. <laughs> this is initially confusing. He was the person who, if you're just simply saying, I'm unhappy with who the Democrats have presented, I'm unhappy with the Democratic field, that he, Nader, would stand in as the proxy for none of the above. If he'd actually run in the Democratic primary, who knows what might happen. Uh, but he didn't. I got a letter from a number of environmentalists in California, uh, led by the great environmentalist David Brower, and he wanted me to uh, be on the ballot for a president in uh, California on the Green Party ticket. Never again, uh, people are told by the Democrats or Republicans, essentially one corporate party with two heads, that millions of people have nowhere to go. We really need multi-party development in this country because we don't have a government of, by, and for the people. We have a government of the Exxons, by the General Motors, for the DuPonts. Uh, but it ended up not really a formal or even technically a campaign from the standpoint of the Federal Election Commission. And the two parties had a deaf ear. Most people feel they're losing control to the big guys, the fat cats that dominate the country. It doesn't matter whether they put a conservative, liberal, progressive label on. They don't, uh, they don't like to see the country being taken from them, the democracy for sale. I think what Ralph saw was a betrayal of democracy by the Democratic Party that started really in the mid to late 70s and continued on rapidly during the 80s. It was something the Democrats had never done before. About 40 prospective congressional candidates lined up so they could be inspected by representatives of about 50 business political action committees. There was a movement largely instigated by Tony Coelho, who was at that time was the third ranking member of the House leadership. The House and the Senate were both controlled by Democrats then. He said, there is no reason why the Republican Party should be getting all of those contributions. Business PACs are sincerely and legitimately looking for Democratic candidates to support. What we're really looking for is money, you see. Well, that's what we're here to talk to you about. Most of the candidates thought it was a good idea. The Democrats finally doing for the first time something the Republicans have been doing for years. Because of the K Street lobbyists, the only way we can compete in a two-party, basically two-party system is that we've got to raise somewhere near the amount of money that Republicans raise. The result of that, of course, was that the Democratic Congressional Party became very compromised. Uh, the corporations pay their, you know, room, board, tuition, beer, money, everything for these guys. Sad to say, uh, because uh, that distorts uh, the choices of people right from the beginning. You had situations where Democrats who represented very progressive liberal districts would wind up voting for some corporation on some environmental issue, and everybody would say, what? And then you'd look closely and you would see the effect of a campaign contribution. I figured that unless you have your own resources, a couple hundred million dollars, you can't have the effect. And so I've given it up. What does that say about a democracy? Well, I think our democracy is a fraud. I think the, uh, uh, it's, it's a consumer fraud. For 20 years, we saw the doors closing on us in Washington, in our citizen groups and a lot of other citizen groups. And what are we here for? To improve our country. And uh, we couldn't get congressional hearings, even with the Democrats in charge. The Democrat Party was in as low a position in terms of any espousing progressive politics has ever been. Uh, when we now confront a really ruthless Bush presidency, suddenly everybody before Bush looks good. My fellow Americans. Uh, Clinton, for instance, has been much overrated as a so-called liberal president. Uh, Clinton essentially followed the 
aggressive foreign policy that had existed before him. He initiated the idea of Iraq having weapons of mass destruction. And in domestic policy, he was uh, pitiful. I mean, it was Clinton who signed the bill doing away with federal aid to families with dependent children. When Clinton and Gore wouldn't meet with Ralph in their last term, on issues that Ralph really had something distinguishing to say on auto safety regulation, for example, it infuriated Ralph, rightly so. When I saw uh, the neglect, the indifference, the greed, uh, the corruption of the two parties, uh, and I looked around and I said, hey, is there anyone else running for president? I mean, be my guest. He would have welcomed a really progressive candidate, not just talking politics, but actually running and trying to get elected. And there just wasn't anyone in the horizon. Nobody wanted to step forward. And year after year would go by, and I didn't want to step forward. And then I began realizing that bad politics was driving out potential good candidates. That I would meet people all over the country and say, you know, I'd like to write, run for the Senate. I'd like to run for governor. I'd like to run for the, but it's such a dirty game. I don't want anything to do with it. I've knocked on thousands of doors in my life campaigning, and I'll tell you, the, the, the number one comment I hear from people is, politicians, they're all crooks. Politicians can't trust them. In ancient Athens, politics was a glorious word. It was the word used as an antidote to autocracy. And now, these rascals in politics this two-party elected dictatorship has turned politics into such a dirty word that the whole idea of elected public service is now distasteful to thousands and thousands of wonderful people in this country. That's when I said, okay, that's the final straw. I have got to step forward. I remember saying down through the years, people would come up to me and say, why don't you, why isn't Ralph from it? I said, forget it. He's not going to run. He's not going to run. And boom, he ran. I couldn't wait to get on the bus. I remember George Stephanopoulos calling up and saying, what are you doing? And uh, I said, well, we're running for president. Um, you know, but it, that's how the mainstream press uh, treated Ralph's campaign. Like, what is this oddity, this quirk? There were a lot of hiccups uh, in starting uh, in launching Ralph's campaign like he's starting late and a party being as small as it is in a country that's not very tolerant of third parties. The concrete goals were fairly mundane, but they were along the lines of let's raise five million dollars, let's try to get on the ballot in 45 uh, states, uh, let's um, try to get five percent of the electorate so we can help build the Green Party, let's create a lot of local Greens, let's bring in a lot of new talent into the citizen movement, let's get the issues out there. The very things we should do for the family pocketbook, more fuel efficient cars, more solar energy, more fuel efficient appliances, lighting, air conditioning systems, will also reduce the contribution to global warming. I would make sure corporations pay their fair share of taxes mm -hmm. so the rest of the individuals don't have to pay what they're now paying. You know, if corporations paid the same rate of taxation as they did in the prosperous 1960s, we have another $250 billion in the Treasury. There are almost 50 million people in this country making less than 10 bucks an mm -hmm. hour. 10 bucks. Some of them are making eight, seven, six, five fifty. You can support a family on that. We're spending 15% of our economy on health care. 47 million Americans not covered. 20 more million grossly undercovered. The ones who are covered, they're getting hit with more co-payments, deductions, exclusions, givebacks, and negotiation with employers, mm -hmm. and pre-existing conditions. So I don't believe in Gore's step-by-step, -step, and I don't believe in that phony package that George W. Bush put out last week either. Mm -hmm. we, we have a bunch of of skulking, cowardly politicians in Washington. They don't want to go, go down in history as fighting for the people as much as they want to go down next week and get some cash from special interest groups. Grilled tenderloin for fundraiser, $1,000 a plate. Campaign ads filled with half-truths, $10 million. Promises to special interest groups, over $10 billion. Finding out the truth, priceless there are some things money can't buy without ralph nader in the presidential debates the truth will come in last find out how you can help go to votenader.com one of our press 
uh, people came to me and said, MasterCard called and they, they want us to pull the ad and, uh, or else they're going to they're gonna sue us. And I said, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> I said, bank my day. <laughs> the suit we filed asks uh, for discontinuation of uh, airing the spot on TV as well as monetary damages of $5 million. They had no sense of humor about it. We've spent a lot of time developing the Priceless campaign, and we're very concerned that our consumers are confused. It's amazing to me that MasterCard, I mean, would take the bait and try to sue him on that and, and therefore just replicate the thing a thousand times, have every TV station in America show it for nothing. And they continue to sue us, but we won on all counts on summary judgment. Priceless. Yeah. I see it a little bit differently. Initially, the Democratic Party and the, the Gore campaign uh, paid very little attention to the NATO campaign. They thought, okay, third party, they're not going to get anywhere because we've already rigged the system. As uh, the campaign developed in 2000 and they saw that uh, we were uh, getting, you know, five, seven percent in some major states that they were starting to get concerned about. came into the green room at CNN. And I walked in, there was a Democrats there, and there was Lanny Davis and some other guys, and it was, hey, Pat, how are you? Good going? Yeah, how's, it, how's it going out there? And, uh, and then Ralph came in behind me, and he said, hey, Pat, how are you? I said, hi, Ralph. And this everybody backed away. <laughs> and he said, they're shunning me. And he was right. They wouldn't even talk to him. They wouldn't even talk to him. And it was remarkable, but they really saw him as a mortal threat. Nader's Raiders for Gore came about when Gary Sellers, who was one of the first people who worked for Ralph full time in the summer of 69, had a, an argument with Ralph about the effect of Ralph's candidacy on a Democrat. Ralph pooh pooed it all. What did he say? I wish I were as uh, 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 knowledgeable as to the future that you are, or something like that. It was a really kind of a condescending comment and put him down. Gary came away from that really furious. It's really sad. Ralph is a very sophisticated political thinker, a profound thinker. He knows what the consequences are. And so Gary called us and said, look, we ought to put together a letter to Ralph, an open letter to Ralph, set up this, maybe we can help get Ralph out of the race. The, the consequences are, are really profound. Of course it'll lurch the Democratic Party a little bit to the left, but it'll take 30 years to undo the harm that Ralph is going to do in the next 12 days. And out of it came a composite letter that um, we presented to Ralph and opened up a website and uh, got in business as Nader's Raiders for Gore. Imagine his own former associates have turned against him. You know, that, that always makes for newspaper copy. Ralph's response to this bothered me a good deal. Ralph's public response was that, oh, these are just some people who worked for me a very long time ago, and uh, they've gone on to their uh, uh, other activities. The implication being that whatever public interest we had years ago was long gone, and now we were out there uh, uh, working for Philip Morris or something like that. I was approached by them and uh, I asked everybody who approached me simple questions. I said, how do you feel about universal health care? How do you feel about the death penalty? How do you feel about NAFTA? And then they would agree with me on all the issues. And I would say, so why are you supporting Gore? I don't think there was anything that Ralph Nader stood for in his campaign that I didn't believe in. There wasn't anything that he said that I didn't think was right or wouldn't make this a better country if those policies were enacted. But it was very clear that Ralph Nader was not going to be elected president. My feeling was, listen, I'm on the outside, I'm firing Republicans, I'm firing in Democrats, I want to be free to do that. I'm not going to support anybody. I'm not going to run your campaign, Ralph. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, sign a letter opposing you. I'm completely out of it. And I think a lot of, of Nader's Raiders took that position because, as he taught us, we hit whoever gets elected. We want to be in a position to do that. In late June of 2000, Ralph called me and he said, Greg, I want you to, to do an exquisite event for me when I'm in Portland on August 25th. 
the Kafori and McDougal team in Oregon said, well, why don't we rent um, the Coliseum in Oregon, which seats something like nine, ten thousand people. We had to divert all the financial resources and able to be, to be able to do that. And then because all of our financial resources were tied into doing that, we had to make sure they, they worked. An hour into the show, they had completely sold out. They were turning people away. 10,000 people paid seven bucks a head just for Ralph. No entertainment, no music, just Ralph's political message. And the super rallies were born. Thank you. Thank you very much. We did Seattle, we did Minneapolis, we did Boston, uh, had, a, had a great event in Boston. It was one rally at a time, and every rally had a tiny surplus and gave us an opportunity to go to the next city. I remember he called me up and said, uh, we're going to do New York, New York City, Madison Square Garden. I said, okay, next month? He goes, no, in 10 days. And I thought, I said, are you crazy? 10 days, New York City, Madison Square Garden? He goes, no, you can do it. 300,000 bucks to do Madison Square Garden. It was 10 days of no sleep, and it was quintessential Ralph, where it was like, we're doing this, and don't ask any questions, just do it. It can be done. I have faith in the people who are behind this, so let's do it. We had Eddie Vedder, Ian DeFranco, Bill Murray, Tim Robbins, Susan Sarandon, Ben Harper, Patti Smith, Phil Donahue, Michael Moore. It was just, it was an unbelievable line. Someone said to me, who are you going to vote for? And I said, I'm going to vote for Ralph Nader. <laughs> who are you going to vote for? You understand that it is more than a win or lose situation. It's the bigger picture. And this is where that bigger picture begins. We're at the place we're at because we have settled for so less for so long. If we keep settling, it's only going to get worse. The lesser of two evils, you still end up with evil. You still end up with evil. It really gave me a lot of hope for our society because there are issues being talked about that night which had not been talked about in 20, 30 years in American politics. The students are not learning. They're not learning citizen skills. They're not learning how to practice democracy. They're not learning the creative force of their personality and idealism and imagination. Maybe if we started talking about citizen globalization, civic globalization, instead of corporate globalization, the world will move forward. Let not future generations look back on us and say that this was the last generation that refused to give up so little in order to achieve so much. He fights almost impossible battles, and he's, he's won a number of them. He's, uh, he's not afraid. I think he's the best American I know. I expected this to be on the front page of the New York Times. And we had a story, but it was buried, you know, 20 pages in. No other political person, Bush or Gore, hadn't gotten 20,000 people to pay money to come hear them speak, all campaign. Ralph was the only guy doing it, and yet the establishment media froze us out. And the kind of coverage that we did get was all about the horse race. How are you going to affect Al Gore? From the very beginning months of the campaign, uh, we knew uh, in 2000 and in 2004 we would have to try uh, to get into the presidential debates. Ralph Nader could visit every city and town in this nation personally and not reach 10% of the people who watch the debates. Now, most people don't understand how the presidential debates are run. They have memories of the League of Women Voters hosting it, or some, and you know, or they think journalists host it. Uh, but it's really a private corporation that sits a few blocks away from here, on New Hampshire Avenue in Washington D.C., that is run by former chair of the Democratic 
National Committee and the former chair of the Republican National Committee. One was a, one is a, the biggest lobbyist for the gaming industry. The other is a lobbyist as well, both. Frank Ferenkoff and Kirk produced, they were producers, so they decided which candidates the uh, voters could see. And, they, and their sponsors were Bud, Anheuser-Busch, U.S. Airwaves, corporations. Can you imagine how much an American corporation would want Ralph Nader on that stage? They set criteria that says you have to have 15% of the uh, measure of support measured by the average of five different national polls. But if, if what we're picking is a poll number, then what we're picking, what we're in effect saying is, we'll allow you in the debates if we think you're a factor in the election. And so in an election in which now the Gore world wants to say, Ralph Nader lost the election for us, I guess he must have been a factor in the election. But you said he couldn't be in the debates because he wasn't a factor in the election. You had, uh, you know, polls showed two-thirds of the American people wanted him in the debates. Well, because Ralph Nader speaks to issues that the other two candidates history. are going. Both candidates are pro-death penalty, for instance. To look at which issues concern the American public. Fairly broad swath of them were not being covered in the debates, as far as we can tell. But they froze Ralph out of the debates. The first debate between Gore and Bush was Tuesday, the 3rd of October, in Boston. The campaign had decided uh, that uh, if we weren't going to be able to be in the actual debate on the stage, that we were going to try to be in the debate hall. 30 seconds. I got a phone call from Ralph's uh, entourage that was touring with him at about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And they said, Jason, what we really want for tomorrow is a ticket to the debate. We got this kid in the University of Massachusetts where the debate was going to be held, and his dad had gotten him a ticket. I called this kid, and I said, how would you, in the name of democracy, like to have a press conference tomorrow at Harvard where you hand over your ticket to Ralph Nader and say, I think you should be there at this debate? And the kid loved it. There were lots of people protesting uh, the exclusion of third parties including, I should mention, not just, you know, the Greens, the Libertarians are upset. Other, the other uh, third parties uh, would like to have a chance to talk to the American people. With my brother, and he wondered, oh, how I am. I said what I believe. Now we hopped on the T, and we rode to this uh, staging area the debates because there's huge security around the debates. Three perimeters and all the Secret Service and, and uh, hundreds of cops and so forth. And there were also well over 5,000 people there protesting to let my uncle on the debates. It was an unbelievable scene. It was like out of some, you know, gigantic painting of a semi-revolutionary journey. As we started passing these barricades and these thousands of people, they recognized uh, my uncle inside the bus, and they just went crazy. <laughs> Our ticket was uh, was for a, a you know video of the debate, where we'd watch it from a remote location. I was uh, confronted by someone who said he was in charge of security for the debate commission, uh, a private security firm. And they said, uh, you, Mr. Nader, are not welcome. The man who came out had a Greek last name. It was Vazaris. And uh, my uncle greeted him in Greek, and so he uh, it sort of threw him off a little bit. It was pretty comical. But he immediately reverted to Mr. Nader, you're not welcome here. Okay, here's the situation. Yeah. We have an arrangement to do a show with Fox. Their truck is inside. We could walk through with our ticket, sit in the truck, watch the debates, and do the show. Yeah, the next 
That's not an option, sir. Right now, the commission is saying they will not let us through the gate to sit in the Fox truck to watch the show, the debate, and then uh, proceed with the, with the interview. So the officers are telling us once again that the commission's decision is to have us leave the premises. I kept saying to myself, I can't believe I'm in America. I can't believe this is going on. Gentlemen, so, I think you're being uh, subjected to an unlawful order, and you really ought to go to your superiors, because a private party, a private can, party okay. cannot misuse the status of the of the state police. You're the state police. Correct, right? yes. They cannot do that. Okay, what's going to happen is now yeah. we have two options. Yeah. You were warned once before yeah. that if you returned, you were going to be placed under arrest yeah. for trespassing. Is it your intent to be arrested? Of course not. And okay. I have never been arrested, and I will not be arrested. Well, we're still I'm just saying. I'm going to give you the option, Mr. Mayor, I don't to understand. please leave the yeah. scene, or you're going to be placed under arrest for trespassing. That's it. I really don't want to get in a debate with you out here. We'll give you a police escort off the grounds, or we in fact give you a ride off the grounds, or in fact you can be placed under arrest for trespassing and physically taken off the grounds. Let me please. What would we like to do yeah. right now? Let please. me please, Mr. McPhail, let no. me please just reply to you. I have no understanding why you are being instructed to do this. We have an official invitation from one of the major television networks. Well, they're not allowing you access to the grounds. Who's not allowing? The debate commission? The debate committee, sure. And they have to... I really to... do not want Wait, to no, I don't want, no, I don't want to argue with... You seem like too nice of a no, man no, to no, argue No, I don't want to argue with All I want to ask you is, this is a political exclusion. I'm not a security risk. I'm not being disrupted. This is a political exclusion. You should not be misused. The authority of the state of Massachusetts should not be misused for a political exclusion of a presidential candidate who has a ticket to be in Kripke Auditorium to watch the debate on remote television and who has an official invitation from Fox News. So, I make my point. Very good. This is the strangest situation I've ever seen. How are we going to get you off the property, Mr. We have to get a bond or whatever. The Presidential Debate Commission excluded Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan from the presidential debates. But they also wouldn't even let Mr. Nader into the hall. The independent presidential candidate was given a legitimate ticket by a student supporter for a remote area in the auditorium. But acting like thugs, officials threatened to have him arrested if he didn't leave the premises. Presumably, Mr. Nader's presence might have offended some of the commission's fat cat contributors in their prominent seats. I give him credit. He went down there. I told him, you know, we, we, I went to parochial school, and I'm told you don't go somewhere, you don't go somewhere. He should not have left, and he uh, could have made his point that way uh, by being escorted out manually by the police, and he could have, uh, he could have had a bigger impact uh, in the 2000s. Perhaps, but it would have been a very short, uh, short time, and uh, the complications of being a defendant would have been longer term, and it would have been a defensive situation on my part, not an offensive situation, which what I turned it into when I sued the Commission on Presidential Debates. They threw out the wrong guy this time. Turns out we found uh, in a subsequent lawsuit uh, that their counsel had passed around a Facebook. <laughs> they had Ralph's picture, they gave all the cops. Sheets of paper with the pictures of all the third party candidates and their vice presidential candidates and basically said if any of these people show up on the premises, don't let them in. They had a picture of me that I was going to break in? Okay, this is the Facebook. Kind of look out for these guys, huh? Ralph was the number one guy they're looking for. <laughs> He's on the top of the list. <laughs> The commission did write a written apology, and they ended up uh, giving $50,000 to the uh, Electoral Reform Project at Harvard Law School. It all backs up to the guys outside the Capitol with the briefcases funding the people who make a vote and can make or break billions and billions of dollars worth of business. Their life is, is the price of their stock. And Ralph Nader threatens that. And we, we cannot overstate uh, the power that they bring to stop him from doing that, including the power to decide that he is not going to get on this stage. 
and Nader is showing no signs of backing off. Gore is going to have to understand. He's going to have to earn his votes. Bush has to earn his votes. I have to earn my votes. No one's entitled to any votes. The bottom line, Renee, is it's not over until the votes are counted, and I mean really counted, one by one. Twice we've taken back so-called final results in Florida. My guess is that in a lot of the uh, Nader instances that he got new voters to the poll, as much as Jesse Ventura did when he ran in the state of Minnesota, people who were turned off by the political system altogether decided that they, they would turn out and vote for Ralph Nader. They would not have voted for either Al Gore or for George yeah, Bush. In fact, many people say they, they would have stayed home if those two names alone had been on the ballot and just sat on their hands and not voted for either candidate. But you know what Democrats are going to say. If their candidate loses by 1% and Ralph Nader got two, they're not going to look at the exit polls, Katie. They're going to point their finger and say, Ralph Nader, you're a spoiler, fairly or unfairly. If you look at the numbers in Florida alone, I think it's safe to say that Ralph Nader denied Al Gore a clean victory in Florida. It may be true in other cases as well, but uh, he has had a consequential impact on this presidential election. By the way, I do think that Al Gore cost me the election, especially in Florida. <laughs> and, and that's far greater concern than whether I was supposed to help elect Al Gore. The day after the election, Ralph Nader was the happiest man in America outside the state of Texas and Florida. Uh, I won't forget that, his exaltation at what he had proved. To whom? And I would currently advise Ralph, given the numbers I've seen, that he may be interested in Secret Service protection when he comes in here this morning from some angry Democrats. Well, up and down the street, people would stop me and say things like, um, God, Nader lost us the election. And, you know, it's so horrible. And, you know, I'd say, well, Gore lost you the election. You ran a shitty campaign. For Nader to say that he has no responsibility in that matter is a level of ethical dishonesty and incomprehension that I find absolutely flabbergasted. Every third party candidate got more than the difference uh, between Bush and Gore in the 537 votes in Florida, but the Democratic Party was looking for a scapegoat and I think effectively tried to paint and did paint Ralph Nader as the reason why they were not in office. Not the fact that 10 million more Democrats uh, voted for George Bush and voted for Ralph Nader. I mean, they should have been asking, why are the people who are registered Democrats voting for George Bush uh, rather than Ralph Nader? You know, t there were registered Democrats who voted for Bush. There were registered Republicans who voted for, for, uh, for Gore. You know, this is like, uh, you know, the dog ate my homework. Except, that, you know, it wasn't my dog. Everybody else's dog ate my homework. This is not, this is not intellectually serious and it's not ethically serious. Why did they lose their own state? Uh, Al Gore is from Tennessee. He didn't carry his own state. He didn't carry Clinton's state, Arkansas. He's our incumbent vice president for eight years who doesn't carry his home state and, uh, the, and the state of his, you know, president. Those are the kinds of questions, not that a third party, uh, be it the, the Greens or the Libertarians or, you know, any third party got some sliver of the vote. You can invent all kinds of excuses um, as to why other people are responsible. Bill Clinton is responsible because he didn't carry Arkansas. Al Gore is responsible because he didn't carry Tennessee. Bullshit. One man could have stopped it. That's Ralph Nader. He chose not to. Why uh, did they do so poorly in Florida in terms of the post-election uh, legal strategies? Why didn't they insist every vote should count? I can, I can spend all day listing the mistakes that Democrat made, Democrats made both before and after Florida. I mean, during, before and during Florida, but I don't care. Nader professed to be standing for one thing when, in fact, he was deliberately causing another thing. The Democrats were just incompetent. Nader was dishonest, and the country is paying the price for it. These people are, these people are the, their, their certitude is born out of the fact that this is, they know now what happened. It was entirely predictable what the likely outcome of that race was, and this megalomaniac thought that his campaign was more important than uh, the potential uh, destruction of, of much of what he claims to stand for. To claim that they were Tweedledee and Tweedledum is to be politically idiotic. It's the responsibility of a serious person not to be a fool. And that was garbage.
a lot of people say, well, he said there was no difference. He didn't say there was no difference between the candidates. He said there are few differences for which they're actually willing to stand up and fight. Okay, you have two corporate parties, but the differences are simply enormous. You don't get, from the Democrats, you don't get big pushes for constitutional amendments to ban gay marriage, and uh, you don't get uh, uh, the, the Labor Department uh, telling Walmart it'll have 15 days to notice before an inspection of possible child labor abuses. Uh, it's on and on with this stuff. And they killed him for saying that there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. They killed him. And then the Democrats spent the next four years proving that he was right. You know, the Democrats folded on the war. They folded on uh, health care. No child left behind. They hid under their desks. If the game was to get 5%, so that you could, um, you could get standing for the 2004 election under the election code, then he should have campaigned in safe states like New York and California where he had many, many potential votes to pick up. Our campaign was not going to play favorites between the two parties. We're going to go for as many votes as we can get, and we were going to be the only campaign to go with the candidates in every state. He told a lot of his contributors. Right. He wasn't going to go into the swing states in 2000. No. I said, I'm not going to go out of my way to go into the swing states. But then he changed his mind. And then he couldn't resist the, the competitive part of it. And so he went into the swing states. From the very beginning, we were very clear on two things. One, Ralph would not drop out, and this would be a 50-state campaign. He promised he wouldn't run hard where it was going to be close. And then he went and spent all of his time at the end of the campaign in swing states. I spent. 27 or 28 days in California and two and a half days in Florida. I mean, if, if anything, I neglected a, this, a swing state like Florida. Uh, it's true that he was in Florida right before the election. I think we spent half a day there and then came up the East Coast. I think Nader intended to be a spoiler. I think Nader is a Leninist. He thinks things have to get worse before they get better. So I viewed those as empirical questions that needed to be answered by a social scientist, that launching opinions back and forth probably wasn't going to solve the debate. And so I simply went out and looked at his campaign schedule from Labor Day of 2000 to Election Day. I looked at all the campaign stops he personally made. So these were places where he held a rally or some other event that was open to the public and gathered media attention. And I matched those to the media markets in which they happen or the states in which they happen. And I also looked at his TV advertising, so where did he run ads? And as I cut the data in every possible way, both the, his candidate appearances and his TV ads, I couldn't find any evidence that he was trying to spoil. There's just nothing there. There was lots of evidence that he was trying to maximize his vote. I've been a Democrat as long as I've been involved in politics. I voted for Al Gore. Actually, my interests are with the Democratic Party first, and yet when I look at the data, I find the pattern you wouldn't expect, that there's no evidence that he was trying to hurt the Democrats and that most of my fellow Democrats' complaints are just sour grapes or a misunderstanding or something else. 52% of the country voted against Bush, either for Nader or Gore. The only way those numbers could have ensured a Gore victory is if Ralph Nader had gone on television the night before the election and said, OK, we've run a good race, we've raised a lot of important issues, but in fact there is a dime's worth of difference between these two parties. And I was wrong to say what I did, and uh, it's just too... There's too much power in this office. There's, there's too much at stake to risk uh, a Republican takeover of the presidency. I have no memory of a candidate ever dropping out at the presidential level because of fear of costing anyone a victory. I've just never seen that. Why would somebody who has uh, gone and recruited, you know, tens of thousands of volunteers, uh, donors, young people, uh, and gone all around the country. And, uh, why would they drop out at the last minute? Uh, what, what message does that send? I'm sorry you supported me for no good reason. I'm sorry these issues don't belong on the table. That would never have come out of Ralph Nader's mouth. The Nader campaign was polling at close to 5% near the end of the 2000 campaign. So a campaign that was geared towards that goal would absolutely keep going. It would make no sense to drop out. It would be irrational to try to uh, you know, uh, avoid an outcome that really puts you close to the goal you've been pursuing 
all along uh, from his entrance in February to the election day in November. If Nader meant what he said, he would have run his race inside the Democratic Party and tried to take it over the same way the Christian coalition took over the Republican Party. You run as a Democrat, you're done in March, and, and you're no longer part of the debate. And it, it, you're making it too easy for them to, uh, to, to channel you and, and to get rid of you and then ultimately to silence you. That's how they treat it. If you want to pull the party, the major party, that is closest to the way you're thinking, to what you're thinking, you must, you must show them that you're capable of not voting for them. Because the, the way the Democratic Party has run now for quite a number of presidential cycles is they pick a nominee in a kind of half-assed process that doesn't really represent much of anybody. And then they tell everybody to just shut up. Don't bring up anything that will complicate life for your nominee. You know he's not for you on this. Why badger him? He's not going to be for you for reasons that you don't understand but are good reasons. Shut up. Turn off your brains. If you don't show them you're capable of not voting for them, they don't have to listen to you. I promise you that. I worked within the Democratic Party. I didn't listen or have to listen to anything on the left in, while I was working in the Democratic Party because the left had nowhere to go. I mean, it was, it was absolutely the most brutal thing to support Ralph in the 2000 election. Oh, there was a terrifically bad fallout, a terrible fallout. A lot of members quit, and uh, we were in terrible financial straits, you know, for a year and a half, two years as a result. It took a long time to build it back up again. I had artists leave my label. I had one very famous artist say he wasn't going to do a song for me anymore because of my support for Ralph. And uh, it was probably the hardest day of my life, and I could not imagine what Ralph was going through at the time. Ralph Nader came to a press conference in support of my candidacy for governor. Somebody came in and threw a pie in his face. The Democrats just totally trash the guy, and they have been trashing him for four years. They're the meanest bunch of motherfuckers I have ever, ever run across. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> I'm Ralph Nader, and uh, I'm on the independent ticket for president with my vice presidential running mate, uh, Peter Miguel Camejo. No rational person could believe that it was a gift to the world to do what he did in the year 2000. So in order to protect his belief that he was, after all, doing the right thing, he needs to repeat. He needs to do it again. To me, uh, he's a del very deluded man. He's a psychologically troubled man. Uh, to continue to argue that he's a force for progressive forces when he's the single most important reason we have the most reactionary president, perhaps in the history of the United States, uh, is a form of delusion that I don't understand its source. We are not convincing you with any of our words, so I'm just going to say, because of all your great service, yeah. and because we do really love you, but we disagree with you on this, Michael and I are going to get down on our knees and beg you not to run. <laughs> Please. 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 Ralph. Don't run Please, for Ralph. president. Because Ralph. you're a great Please. American. Don't, don't do this run. Don't do this. Please. Don't do this. Please. Don't do this, Ralph. Come home, Ralph. Come on. We're on Come our home, knees. Ralph. We're on our knees. Come home. Fight these Republicans. A number of people tried to convince Ralph uh, not to run. And amongst that uh, were people who thought, uh, because they have very little first-hand knowledge of Ralph Nader, that they could bribe him. Well, let me tell you, there were carrots and there were sticks. Nader was told, if you don't run, we will lavish money on your organizations. We will lavish money anywhere you want it. Very extravagant sums of money were mentioned. And he was told face to face, this is just the beginning. Oh, yes. I mean, I, through third parties, millions of dollars were offered for our programs and projects if I would drop out or if I would not decide to run. And at the same time, he was told, if you do run, we will strangle your organizations. We will smother them. Your people will scream in pain at you for what we're going to do to you. Again, there was far more at stake in terms of 
focusing on the redirections of our country than uh, some ample foundation grants to initiate programs which would hit a stone wall here in Washington. I mean, the lesson Ralph took from the 1960s when lots of close friends of his said, you can't go after General Motors, you're a promising lawyer, you're out of Harvard, you'll ruin your career, and he did, was trust your own instincts and don't listen necessarily to people who are close to you. Last time I talked to my slam down the phone on him. <laughs> I got out of the blue. Gene, Ralph. I go, who? You know, uh -huh. Oh, you're calling. Well, he goes, well, I've been kind of busy the last 10 days. <laughs> because he just did I said, yeah, no shit. Um, well, uh, I'm busy right now, so I got to go. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I was surprised I did it, but it was the right thing to do. The me and John Kerry was very constructive. He had been saying just the right thing. I'm going to appeal to everybody in this race, and we'll make it unnecessary in the end for uh, an alternative, but I look forward to that. Fine. It's just the exact kind of competition I relish in. Take all the issues. Here they are, 25 pages. I sent them to you in December. <laughs> Take them all. No proprietorship here. Uh, and then I, I, said to, I said to him, look, Let's try to do something counterintuitive. Let's pick three major issues that we both believe in and run with them. And uh, that will make a real contrast with Bush, corporate welfare, the hundreds of billions of dollars out of taxpayer uh, coffers going into corporate subsidies, handouts, giveaways, uh, bailouts. Let's also crack down on the corporate crime wave. A lot of Republican voters there Bush is never going to come out against corporate crime. And the third thing, labor law reform, because you know that Bush is not going to uh, come out for labor law reform given his corporate paymasters. He wouldn't buy them. Instead, May 2004 was when the massive coordinated attack by the Democratic Party to harass us, to intimidate us, petitioning drives, to file more and more lawsuits, against us, hiring Ken Starr's old law firm, Kirkland Ellis, and other corporate Republican firms, that was the fork in the road. Those three issues would have gotten him more votes, and the election wouldn't even have been close. I'm, I'm John Kerry, and I'm reporting for duty. I have never seen a period in American history so devoid of any tactical and strategic sense by the liberals. And I will hunt down and kill the terrorists wherever they are. What are they scared of, the Democrats? When Kerry was running for office, there was a poll where 42% of the American people wanted the troops home yesterday. Without any leadership by the Democratic Party, without saying to Bush, you don't have the decency even to count the casualties on our side because you're not counting injured and sick troops. I mean, you can't even go after him for something like that. And what we have to decide is that we're going to keep coming back until this war ends. And you let the swift boat veterans turn you on the defensive because you were in Vietnam and Bush was a draft dodger? It's like they've lost their nerve completely. And they basically said, OK, the Republicans are so terrible. Uh, we'll go for the Democrats and then work on them later. But the point is, if you work on them later, it's too late. You've got to work on them during an election campaign to make them look better, to make them stand taller, to make them be more authentic. And then you might get them into office. Kerry is not perfect, but he's so, so, so much better than what's there now. The United goal should be to defeat Bush. Anybody but Bush. Now, let's say he did win. He wouldn't owe any of these people anything because he knew that he got their vote because they disliked Bush so much. What are you going to win if you win? So he would have no mandate. And he would float into Washington, D.C. and be surrounded by 25,000 corporate lobbyists and 9,000 corporate political action committees and all kinds of demands to put high-level appointments in the hands of corporate selectors in his administration. And what do we end up with? What is the victory worth? See? I mean, it was a flawed strategy. And for all their efforts, they lost. Uh, earlier today, uh, I spoke to President Bush and I offered him 
and Laura, our congratulations on their victory. They lost with a candidate who should have landslided Bush, who should have landslided one of the worst presidents in American history. And it's not an unwarranted perception to say that this Bush regime and the ideological hijackers who've taken over our government is a different cup of tea than Reagan or Bush one or Nixon, then you better start making your candidate stand for the things you believe in that will oppose and thwart this extremely dangerous incumbent administration. So not making Kerry better, they made him worse, they made him less electable. When your guy, Ralph Nader, is very close to filing something about what went on in New Hampshire. Oh, well, now he's New my guy. <laughs> well, our guy. <laughs> Boy, you, you got away from him all quick. Him he was your guy the last time, too, as I our recall. Guy. Our guy. It gets hard because I know Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon had a lot of backlash after the election. The worst part is, is that people aren't going to be venturing out on those ledges again because it's, there's, there's nothing in it for them except a lot of criticism. You want me to take a second here and talk about Ralph? Yeah. Michael Moore was a, a, an example of the switch of s aggressively supporting our agenda and our candidacy in 2000 and turning against us in 2004. Leave, leave him alone? <laughs> well, he needs to leave us alone. Um, yeah. In 2000, he went to our rallies and he was the most articulate critic. He made people laugh and cry. If you don't vote your conscience now, when will you start? Then 2004 comes along. And when you go in the voting booth, don't go in there like, oh, this is going to make me feel good, though. I'm going to feel good voting for Ralph Nader because he's pure and I'm pure and I want to feel good. So I'm going to vote for Nader. Listen, my friends, your parents must have told you when you were 14 five minutes of feeling good, you got to pay for it for the rest of your life. Come on! And I'm trying to say why. When he's involved in politics and it's that controversial, it doesn't help a nonprofit organization. And I think that, you know, everyone knows that Ralph founded Public Citizens Pictures all over the building and all the rest of it. But it looks like we're politicking for him when we send out letters, you know, thousands of letters every single day with his name on it. And I don't think that, I think that that puts us at risk both legally and politically. It's a time for us to be our own organization. You know, he gave us a lot, that's it. Uh, I wish Ralph hadn't run. You want me to say more? Perfect, as, um, I'm, I'm, tw I'm wrestling with both, both the, the personal answer to your question and the and the professional answer. On a professional level, I think the election distracted Ralph from issues that, uh, you know, um, he would have been a leader, leading figure on, for example, Enron and WorldCom and the energy crisis here in California. I also think there, that some people were offended by his run and angry with him for it, and, and, and that's probably hurt him with those people. On a personal level, I just, I miss him. My uh, son's 11 and my daughter is uh, 9. And they go, Dad, you used to work for that guy? <laughs> it's like, you should be proud of this. You know, I was proud of this. My parents. You know, when I first uh, started, I was so proud of all that. And, you know, my parents come down, meet Ralph Nader. He's from Connecticut. That was so cool. They were so proud of it. Now, every time I, you know, what's that crazy guy up to? And, I, you know, they're, that's like a focus group of, you know, uh, middle America. Uh, people who actually, you know, again, care about the same things. But, uh, you know, it's like, just lost it. It's sad. I should stop talking about it. <laughs> In case you haven't, t haven't figured it out, <laughs> angry and sad. Okay. That's enough. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Part of the reason he's running is he wants to be heard. Is that ego? I guess. But it's not just the ego of fame, which he's had. It's the ego of trying to uh, make a difference. If that sounds sappy, it's n that's the way he operates. 
He is privately on the phone the way he is in public. It just com outraged by injustice. It's not an act. And that's what motivates him. That's what's motivating him to run for president. You cannot know him and even imagine that this is an ego trip. If anything, it's the opposite because people who are soothing their egos and gratifying them don't do without sleep, don't run on shoestring budgets, don't withstand the kind of abuse that he's gotten. In fact, if it were ego, he wouldn't do it because the likelihood that he ruins a 40-year reputation as being this pro-justice hero would lead most people, if they have an ego, to go, I'm not going to risk hurting myself like that. The issue is if you get things out in the open, uh, you'll get some action. One of the things, along with my dismay at what he's doing about the country here with this running for president, is a real concern that Ralph could harm seriously harm his legacy. Ralph's legacy is insinuated into the fabric of our daily life in ways we don't even appreciate. I, imagine if you got in a car and the airbag said Nader on it. You know, like how everything says Trump on buildings? If the airbag said Nader, or if the seatbelt said Nader, or if you get bumped from a plane and it says your, your remuneration on your ticket and you get it Ralph Nader on your ticket, or, you know, you look at the air and it's cleaner and it says Ralph Nader, or if you look at your food and it says this food was made safer by Ralph Nader, if people would see that on a day-to-day -day basis, they'd understand the effect that this guy has had on their daily lives. Lead uh, protections when you get x-rays in the dentist's office. Warnings, uh, drugs, nutrition labeling on foods, crash testing for automobiles, labeling for cigarettes and tar and nicotine, labeling for tires on their tread wear and safety, the right to know on the job if you're exposed to any chemicals. This was a cause, and we bought into it, we believed it, and we continue to believe it. <clears throat> and anything that affects Ralph's legacy affects us. So I wouldn't want this to hurt his legacy. I don't care about my personal legacy. I care about how much justice is advanced in America and in our world day after day. And I'm willing to sacrifice whatever, quote, reputation in the cause of that effort. And also, what is my legacy? Are they going to turn around and rip seat belts out of cars? Are they going to tear airbags out of cars? Nader really kind of taught me to have that future perspective. Go into the future and look back. And don't care what people are, are, are saying about you now, because they're not as important as the people in the future are, because that's who you're working for. You're working to pass it down the line. You're working to pass it on to the next generation after that and after that and after that. And that's why you are here. I can't think of anyone in American history who better embodies the ethic you can fight City Hall than Ralph Nader. So, so often people go, oh, my vote doesn't count, or all oh, these big interests, you know, I, I, I can't affect it. His whole life, just this no name from Winstead, Connecticut, not because of pedigree or money, talks and wills his way into the national consciousness, and then stands for the ethic that consumers can stand up to corporations and voters can stand up to in incumbents. I've been in Japan, I've been in Eastern Europe, Hungary, right after the Berlin Wall fell, um, Southeast Asia, uh, reporting with various kinds of citizen groups, whether they were campaigning for laws or to take some of the brutality out of sweatshops. And they will invoke Nader's name as a kind of, you know what we're doing, it's like Ralph Nader, right? I mean, now where did they learn that? Who knows? But it's in there. It's in their vocabulary that this man, Nader, is, did what we're doing, what we're trying to do. I suspect that he'll suffer waves uh, over the next hundred years of discovery, rediscovery, and abandonment. That, that periodically, as the cultural heartbeat <laughs> uh, hears a different song, it will yearn for his song and find him. Uh, it's happened to many people. Ralph is, uh, he believes in the legal system. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. The guy is like, he's pushing all this stuff and, and he actually believes in the legal system. And he believes in small business, his family is small business. And he believes, he's a devout small business supporter. Um, and he believes in the marketplace.
I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me that he believes in the market, but he believes in all these really American things of the American grain, and he's getting, he gets trashed for it. I mean, he's one of the very few people who's ever been in this city who actually believes in the American myth. I see how people up against enormous abuse, deprivation, uh, dictator, dictatorships, you name it, taking it on, not giving up, persisting, persevering. That's what life's all about. There'll never be a hill that you don't have to climb when it comes to injustice in this world. But you have to keep climbing it. And the important thing is not to say democracy's a myth in our country, is to have better gradations. Democracy's very weak today in our country. We have to make it stronger and stronger until it becomes the profoundly realistic American way of life and crowds out the myths. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. in the temple Too much money changing hands It's really very simple Just make a list of demands We demand freedom We demand equality We demand justice It ain't gonna happen Folks like you and me just stand up Well, you've been sitting way too long Oh, step up You know what's right and you know what's wrong Rise up Don't let the system hold you down Just one person And who will hear your voice Don't let them fool you You have the power in your hand I'm only trying to school you 